It's a pet peeve of mine. I, I cringe when Muslims want to go back and reinvent history. I don't like this at all. The claim that Aisha was miraculously 18, mashallah, tabarakallah, which just so happens to be the legal age of consent in modern America, mashallah, what a coincidence, mashallah, tabarakallah. I cringe. Really, I cringe. What's really behind the debates on Aisha's age? Well, it's not really about Aisha's age. And that's where I want to push back against some Islamophobes and anti-Muslim critics who will want to say that, you know, so many Muslims are supportive of child marriage. I would say most moderate traditionalists are opposed to child marriage. They wouldn't want to give their own daughters in marriage at that age. It's really only Islamic fundamentalists, which are a fringe, that would uh, want to use or weaponize that the Hadith in that way. Most moderate traditionalists will want to affirm this Hadith about Aisha's age, but the but at the same time move away from child marriage by saying that, look, it, that was okay for that society and time, but we live in a different society and time today. And so there's no problem with instituting a minimum age of marriage. And an example of this is Sheikh Yasser Qadi. He takes this report as historically reliable because it's found in Sahih Bukhari. And at the same time, he says that he has no problem with instituting a minimum age of marriage in today's day and age. So that's, it's a reasonable approach. I think that the report to Aisha is not historically reliable. Nonetheless, it's important to be fair that most traditionalists are not trying to defend child marriage just by saying that this hadith is reliable. But the point that I'm trying to say is that the real dog in the fight that these traditionalists have, the real issue, the real contention, is about hadith canonicity. The scriptural status of hadith that's what's really at stake. And so you need to pay you need to have that in your mind when you're when we're talking about this debate about Aisha's age. And that's important to keep in mind because you'll often find that Islamophobes and anti-Muslim critics and even some Western academics will accuse uh, Muslim reformists of apologia when they're claiming that Aisha was not six or nine years old. Now I don't deny that there this might be considered apologia, but I would first of all point out that just because someone says something with an apologetic intent, it doesn't mean that what they're saying it is not true or could not be true. Those things are independent of each other. And we see that here in this case. Muslim reformists for a long time have been arguing that Aisha was not six or nine years old. And they were, may have been doing so almost certainly for apologetic reasons and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not a reason to dismiss their arguments altogether. In fact, now we see that Dr. Joshua Little, who has no dog in the fight, he's not a Muslim. He's just a critical scholar who's evaluating the evidence. He finds that actually the Muslim reformists are right. So that's point number one. Point number two is that the Islamic traditionalists who are defending this hadith also have their apologetic agenda. And again, I use the apologetic word not in any pejorative way. I believe that any religious person engages in apologia because that just means defending the viewpoints that you believe in. But we need to recognize that when they're defending the report of Aisha being six or nine years old, they're not doing it just because they're convinced that is a historical fact. Rather, it's that this report is found in Sahih Bukhari and they want to defend Sahih Bukhari from attack. And so we can look at a Facebook post by Sheikh Yasser Qadi on August 9th, 2018, when he says, quote, some people raise such doubts, he's talking about doubts about Aisha's age, that she wasn't really nine years old, as a part of an attempt to attack this book by the greatest scholar of Hadith our Ummah has ever seen. He's talking about Imam Bukhari, and he's talking about his bo uh, the book of Hadith, Sahih Bukhari. He goes on to say, but such attacks are not even equivalent to a gust of wind that attempts to blow down a fortress. So what we see is his real concern is that such doubts are going to poke holes in Sahih Bukhari and threaten the Hadith canon altogether. So this is about a wider debate that's going on in the modern uh, Islamic context in which Muslim reformists have been arguing for a reevaluation of Hadith in general. So there is a general state of Hadith skepticism or caution towards Hadith that exists amongst modern Muslims. 
And this is much to the chagrin of staunch conservative traditionalists. Let's move on. I do think that some Islamophobes are going to say, look, it doesn't matter whether or not this event actually took place. The point is that Muslims think it took place and that's what's important. And so the Muhammad of faith did marry Aisha at nine years old, even if the Muhammad of history did not. But this is a problematic argument because the fact is that the Muhammad of faith is a reconstruction by Muslims themselves. And as we've acknowledged, many modern Muslims do not agree that Aisha was nine years old. There is absolutely no way to claim that the majority of Muslims today believe that Aisha was six or nine years old. All right. The, if you go to an average Muslim anywhere in the world and you ask how old Aisha was, I guarantee you that, the, first of all, the vast majority are not going to know. Okay. A lot of them are going to argue that she was older and only a small percentage of people are going to actually try to staunchly defend the fact that she was nine years old. Okay. So this is actually a viewpoint that's under attack and conservative traditionalists are feeling the heat from that and so they're pushing back and that's why you have their repeated statements trying to reinforce the fact that she was six or nine years old. Well, we know that they're issuing these statements because there's widespread doubts amongst modern Muslims about how old she actually was. Again, I don't think Aisha was six or nine years old when she was engaged or married and we know that from Do Joshua Little's Oxford dissertation. This whole argument, this whole discourse we do need to recognize that there is a fallacy of presentism behind the Islamophobic critique, right? You're using modern Western social sexual mores and imposing them upon pre-modern societies across the globe and then arguing that all of them are somehow sexually perverse. So I do think that there's something problematic with that. Think about it. They would look at our modern Western sexual morals as being problematic. But the point I'm trying to say is it, it is quite hypocritical that modern Westerners are critiquing pre-modern societies for the fact that they married younger, especially when they didn't live as long and it was just a completely different society altogether. You didn't go to college, etc. Um, so there is this argument that's, you know, falls into the fallacy of presentism that we need to keep in mind. I personally think Muslims, we Muslims, can get blue in the face making the argument that this wouldn't make the prophet a pedophile um, and that this was normal back then and we just have different social historical circumstances now. We can make this kind of argument till we're blue in the face. It's just not going to be effective. It's just far easier to argue using the latest historical critical scholarship that the, the idea is false altogether, that the prophet did not marry Aisha at this young age. I think that's just an easier argument to make. Most Muslims today are not going to encourage child marriage. We have to be real. There are some Islamic fundamentalists and extremists who will justify child marriage and will try to use this hadith to do that. For example, ISIS will do that. So it is important that we put forward the view that these hadith reports are not historically reliable. And there are reasons for traditionalist Muslims as well to go away from the literal meaning of this hadith report. I think Dr. Little's dissertation is extremely useful from this perspective. I also think this, this shows that not all historical critical scholarship is somehow inimical to Islam. And it's also not true that Muslims, all Muslims, oppose historical critical scholarship. In fact, many Muslims around the globe are interested to see what Western scholars have to say about Islam and the Quran. And by the way, Western scholars doesn't mean just non-Muslims. There are tons of Muslim academics in the Western Academy, and I consider myself as one of them. I do think that Muslims should turn to the historical critical scholarship in order to find out what the Prophet Muhammad actually did or said. And from that perspective, it's actually useful. We'll make another video about that in the future. We'll also follow up this video with the Quranic verse that's often invoked to claim that the Quran itself sanctions child marriage. That is completely false. There's no truth to that at all, but we'll tackle that in the next video. I hope you enjoyed our first video series. I hope you'll like, share, subscribe. And if you think that this content is useful, please do consider uh, dropping a donation as well. That would be very much appreciated. We're trying to produce high quality content and push back against the extremist voices that exist on the internet. So thank you so much and see you next time.